Chaksu un militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha. Nama om Vishnu padaya Krishna prasthaya bhutale shumakti bhakti viranta swami tinamene. Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravali Pacharine Nivasi Sarsindhya Vali Pastyatya Deva Karine Panchakopa Thurubhistya Kripa Sindhu Veva Chapatita Nam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namaha Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasudhi Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Ramari Murti Shukalani Amena Tishtana Navatara Akaro Bhuvane Shukinchum Krishna Swayam Samabhavat Padamam Pamanyo Govinda Madhi Purusham Tamaham Vajami. So the Lord manifests himself in various forms of himself in order to perform his pastimes in the material world. The Lord comes to the material world to give pleasure to his devotees and to protect his devotees against the demons. As Srila Prabhupada says, the Lord has no business coming just to kill the demons if he wants. He can kill the demons simply by creating some earthquake or some material cataclysm where so many thousands of demons are destroyed. It's not his business to come just simply to kill the demon, but when he comes to protect the devotees or give his association to the devotees, to uplift the devotees in their practice of Krishna consciousness, he winds up killing many demons who are bothersome, harassing the devotees. Just like with Prahlad Maharaj, he didn't come until Harani Kashipu started to try to kill the Lord Maharaj and then the Lord made his appearance. So he appeared in the cell, the, the uh, jail cell of Kamsa to protect Devaki and Vasudev. Well, the Lord comes to protect his devotees. And so again, or sometimes he comes just to please his devotees by giving his devotees his transcendental uh, opportunity to associate and to serve him in his personal form. So uh, we are about to embark on one of the more important manifestations of Krishna on the Sri Ramchandra, who appeared in a place that is still there today, Ayodhya Dham. And uh, one can go see it. The holy place of the Lord's appearance is actually there. Well, we were there in 1999. And that, at the time, the place was under contention still is to some degree, but it seems like the Vaishnavas have managed to recapture the authority and the control of Ram's birthplace. At that time, it was under great contention. So we went there and we also saw the place where the Lord took his appearance to Darshan. So this story, which is narrated throughout the entire world known as the Ramayan, is filled with so many interesting pastimes of the Lord, killing demons, showing the principle of saintly rule, showing the principle of ideal husband, ideal friend, ideal brother, ideal son. And uh, so I'll try to narrate a little bit, starting from the beginning. 
Ayodhya, Dom, at that time, this was approximately two million plus years ago. Uh, it was 96 square miles in land area, huge area, 96 square miles. And it was ruled by one very saintly king whose name was Dasarath. <laughs> Dasarath was a powerful king. Um, he received the name Dasarath because Dasa means 10 and Rath, Rath, Rata, Dasaratri, Dasarati refers to chariots. So in his youth, he was battling many opponents. And it appears that he was appearing in 10 places at one time. He was such an expert fighter. So he was given the title Dasarat. So we know him as Dasarati or Dasarat. Dasarat was a, an amazing king. He had complete rule of his subjects. Of course, around the area, there are always contentions with demons. And there are many wonderful stories how Dasarat assisted in destroying the demons. But Dasarat, although he was so powerful, influential, uh, respected, loved, he uh, wasn't able to have a son. It says in the uh, explanation by the authors of the Ramayan, both Tulsi Das and uh, Valmiki, that Dasarat had three principal queens, Koshaya, Sumitra, and Kaikei. Actually, Dasarat had more than three queens. In fact, these were the three principal queens, but Dasarat had actually 350 other wives. Mm -hmm. And that's meant, mentioned in another in Kumbi's Ramayan. How did he have so many wives? And it's not so much mentioned in the main Ramayans. Where does that come from? It's interesting. I thought I brought it up just for the sake of interest. Is at that time, Parasaram was also roaming the planet. And Parasaram didn't like Kshatriyas at all. Uh, you know, his father was killed by a Kshatriya. And, uh, and he also understood that the Kshatriyas were very much proud of their position and arrogant. So he was in a manifestation of the Shakti energy of the Supreme Lord. And he came in order to rid the world of Kshatriya kings. So one of the rules that uh, Parasaram followed that he would never kill the king who is engaged in having a marriage. And Dasarath was aware of that. So Dasarath was always concerned that Parasaram would come. So every time he got a notice from his messengers that Parasaram was in the, in the area, Dasarath would have another wedding. And this way he had 350 other wives. <laughs> So he, he took these marriages as a way to protect himself from Parasaram. That's mentioned in Kumbi's Ramayan. Dasarat had one daughter. Her name was Shanti. And Dasarat had a good friend who was another king in another kingdom nearby, whose name was Romapada. 
Prabhupada also was in the same situation. He had no issue. And feeling concerned for his king friend, his Dasarad gave his daughter Shanti to Romapad to raise as his own daughter. So Romapad raised Shanti, who was the daughter of Dasarath, like that. But Dasarath always wanted a son because he always was thinking, I'm getting old and I have no son. And all attempts to have a son has failed. So what to do? And nothing, and he was in despondence and time was running. He was getting old and it was time for him to leave his position and empower a follower to take over the throne. Of course, the tradition is that the king has a son and the son, the prince becomes the king. But that wasn't there. So in the kingdom of Romapad, uh, there was a extreme drought. And this drought went on for many, many months. Mm -hmm. It became a great concern to all the residents of the kingdom of Romapad what to do. It was a crisis. There was no rain and the drought was having its effect negative in effect. There was one sage living in the forest. His name is Prabanda. I think that's his name. Some people give him a different name. Prabanda had a son who was an unusual son. He was born from an, uh, a woman and an animal. And he had these thorns, not thorns, but uh, what do they call them? Uh, tusks coming out of his forehead. And his name was Rishashringa. Now Rishashringa was, was taken care of by his father Prabhanda and he wanted Rishashringa to grow up to become a staunch brahmachari. So he made sure that no woman would come near Rishishringa. So out throughout his whole life, Rishishringa never saw a woman and didn't even, even know what a woman was. His only association with his father and few of the stages that were in the area. So Romapar was thinking what to do about this drought. So he called his ministers many times and they gave different advice. Finally, one minister, he said, my dear king, there is a solution. You can stop the drought if you can bring this sage named Rishi Shringa who's living in the forest to hear and marry your daughter Shanti. And together they can perform a sacrifice and that sacrifice will bring rain. So after hearing from his ministers, Romapad was thinking what to do. So Rishishringa was carefully guarded by his father to make sure he would never leave the area where he was living. His father would take care of everything he needed. And the boy was happy. He was young. Not young, and, and he was a young man, but he was young. So the minister said that you have to allure Rishishring away and bring him here. And then when you do, you can get him married to your daughter. So Momopad was, was thinking how to do that. And the advice came to get some concubines, <laughs> some ladies, and uh, have them go into the forest 
and allure uh, Rishi Sringa away. Hmm. How to do that? Because Prabhanda, his father, was very protective. So these three girls, they were on the mission, and they brought with them a whole basket of sweets, plus many beautiful flowers. And they dressed themselves up very uh, uh, attractively. And they came to the forest and they waited to the right time. But Prabhanda had to leave for a little while to gather some fruits and herbs to bring back to the hermitage. So while he was gone, the girls came and they saw Rishishringa there. Rishishringa saw these personalities, but he had never saw a woman before, so he was a little bewildered. Boy, these men look quite strange. <laughs> I've never seen men like this before, because he had never saw a woman in his whole life, nor even heard about them. His father was making sure he, he would be kept in complete secrecy. So these girls came and they started to speak sweet words to him. And he was starting to be charmed by their very ladylike uh, voices. Prabhupada says, this is one of the ways that men become attracted simply by the voice of a woman. She attracts the man just by the sound of the voice. And so they start offering him nice sweets and he was eating it. And then he st all of a sudden he started to feel a little different. <laughs> Something was happening and he couldn't understand why he was feeling attraction for these personalities. And he didn't under under uh, couldn't understand what was that, where, what was that attraction? And then finally, the girls left. I put the sweet up on the thing there. Do you see that? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll go with it. Yeah. And uh, so they left. His father came back, seeing the boy, and see that something strange was happening. He couldn't understand what was happening. But now Rishishringa was unhappy because he had developed such an attraction for these ladies, not knowing the source of his attraction. And now he was unhappy that they were gone. So his father was concerned that something was happened, but Rishishringa never said anything to his father. So one time again, Rishishringa now feeling separation from these people, he decided to leave his hermitage and try to find them. And they remained in the area and he did find them and they brought him to the kingdom of Romapad. And when he was there, uh, Romapad greeted him and offered his daughter in marriage. And so the marriage between Rishishringa and Shanta, and her name was Shanta, not Shanti, I'm sorry, I said Shanti, but it's Shanta. And uh, so then, then he performed a sacrifice, and because of that sacrifice, because Rishi Sringa was, he was, a, he was a nice, sticky brahmachari. He had been brahmachari his whole life, so he had power. If you remain celibate your whole life, you become very powerful. And so he was very powerful. And so by that power and his purity, the sacrifice produced rain in the kingdom of Omar. The news got back to Dasarat, what had happened. And so Sumanta, who was the, uh, not Sumanta, but uh, what was his name? I can't think of his name. The minister who was working under the care of Dasarat. Anybody remember the minister's name? Vashishta, that's right. Vashishta was the minister. Vashishta said to Dasara, you, have, you know, if you want to have a son, 
it is Shanta and, uh, and Rishi Shringa. If you bring them here and hold a sacrifice, then you will have a son. So Dasarat spoke with Romapad Swami and Roma, uh, Romapad Maharaj, the king, and brought him Rishi Shringa along with his wife Shanta. And they performed this grand sacrifice called Purushrestha, I think it was called. And a fire sacrifice was performed and Rishi Shringa was the person who did the sacrifice. He had been taught all this stuff by his father when he was living in the forest. And now after performing the sacrifice from the fire in the sacrifice, a beautiful black personality raised out of the fire and he had a golden pot in his hand. And he left the, he presented the pot to Dasarat and he said, there was some communication and then the personality disappeared. So in that pot there was called hyacin. Hyacin is the type of foodstuffs that's produced from, from yagya. And it was understood that he was to distribute this hyacin to his three wives. So uh, he took half and gave it to Koshalya. He gave the other half to Kaikei, then he took that other half that he gave to Kaikei and divided it again and gave one fourth to Kaikei and one fourth to Sumitra. And after some time, all three of the women produced sons. From Koshaya came Ram, from Sumitra came Sutragna and Lakshman, and from Kaikeya came Bart, four beautiful sons who were an incarnation of the Chaturvyuha, Vasudev, Sankarsana, Aniruddha, and Pradyumna. Others say that that is also correct, but they are also expansions of the four weapons or the four symbols carried by Lord Narayan, which are the Kanchal, the lotus, the club, and the disc. Two symbols for the devotees, two symbols for the demons. <laughs> so now, uh, each of these boys, of course, is a beautiful, beautiful story, how they grew up and became close friends with each other, were always with each other, and they developed an attraction for each other amongst all four of them, but they kind of paired off. Bart and Satrugna became very close, and Ram and Lakshman became very close. And there's many, many stories during that time. Of course, the one story we, we hear is Vishwamitra Muni was in the forest. Vishwamitra Muni was a powerful sage. Formerly, he had been a Kshatriya, but having been defeated by Brahma Tejas, the power of a Brahmin, he decided to give up his Kshatriya position and become a Brahmin because he understood Brahmins are more powerful than Kshatriyas. Because Brahmins can control Kshatriyas by their power. Just like we have the example in the story of King Vena in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the fourth canto, where King Vena was such an evil king. He was the son of Maharaj Nidra. And uh, although he was such an evil king, uh, and he had stopped all sacrifices, all activities of Brahminical culture, he was practically uh, a demon. He was, uh, the only thing good about King Vena's rule was that he, because everyone was afraid of him, there were no crime in the kingdom because if he, anyone was caught committing any crime, they would be immediately killed. So he was such a ruthless. And so the Brahmins, they had petitioned him in so many ways to continue sacrifices and to explain that the, the duty of a king is to worship the Supreme Personality of God and then teach his subjects the same. 
And he would say, what is the use? I am the, I actually am the Supreme person. You worship me. So after Brahmins had heard his arrogance and his defiance of all religious principles, they got together, performed the sacrifice. And by the power of that sacrifice, they killed Vena. Just by performing a sacrifice, they were so powerful that they could actually kill Vena. So when a Brahmin is actually a real Brahmin, he has really great power. Uh, we have so many examples of Brahman's curse and Brahman's power and Brahman's, uh, uh, how they are so influential, but so, so compassionate at the same time, they never misuse their power in, the, in, the, in a way for personal interests. <laughs> always for the interest of the people in general or for the interest of, of the worshiping the Supreme Lord. And so, uh, yeah, so Vishwamita, he came, became a Brahmin. And uh, there was some trouble when he was having sacrifices with many of other sages. There were these two demons called Subahu and Maricha. And they would always disturb the sacrifice. They would come and they would defile the sacrifice. They would throw feces and urine and all kinds of dead animals and blood all over the sacrifice and desecrate it. And this was, became a great disturbance. They couldn't perform any sacrifices. So Vishwamita, he because he was a former Kshatriya and a powerful Brahmin, he could he could have killed these demons himself. But he realized it's not the job of the, the Brahmins to kill demons. So he came to see and visit Maharaj Dasara, knowing he had four wonderful sons. And Dasarat greeted the sage and uh, he asked him in so many ways, how can we serve you? Because it's the duty of the Kshatriyas to welcome the Brahmins and offer something. Because the Brahmins property, they always use for worship, for sacrifice, or for helping people in general. They take what they need, they don't live it gorgeously although they received much. So after spending some time with Dasara, I'm, I'm kind of skipping a lot of the details. Uh, Dasara said, oh, I, I, I see you have come for some reason. What is the reason? And he explained how these demons were defiling the sacrifice and, and he needed someone. He, uh, and he said, actually, your son, Ram, Ram was only a 16 year old boy at the time. Uh, please give me Ram and he'll, I'll take him and he, he will easily dispatch these demons. When Dasrat heard that, he was shocked, <laughs> Ram. He's only a young boy. How is it possible? Actually, if you want, I will come with my armies and I will help you. He said, no, no, this is a dis only, I only came for that request. Ram is the person. You don't know the power of your own son. But Dasarath was in anxiety, but Ram was there and he also heard, he said, yes, father, I will go. And so rather than refuse the Brahmin, which would have been a great offense, he reluctantly allowed Ram to go. And when Ram came, he was there in the sacrifice. And then when the, those demons came, uh, Ram jumped into action. So he shot an arrow and hit the chest of Subahu and immediately killed him. And he shot another arrow and hit Maricha. But this arrow was so powerful that it knocked Maricha 800 miles into the ocean. <laughs> and he was gone. But he wasn't killed. He was just 
thrown away by the power of the arrow. And then, of course, um, Vishwamitra was very happy and the sages could again perform their sacrifice. And this was the first incident that we know in the Ramayana where it shows the power of Ram. So as the, as the uh, Ram returned and when his father had heard what had happened, he was amazed to hear about the quality of his son. And of course, uh, there were so many amazing stories as the boy used to grow up. Um, I'll tell some of those stories tomorrow. So I wanted to just give a little introduction to the beginning of the Ramayana and how uh, the Lord appeared. And he appeared for, uh, because actually it was the, demi the demigods. The demigods were concerned that this really powerful king, whose name was Ravana, was ravaging the whole countryside with his demoniac activities. And he was harassing the sages and other saintly persons. <coughs> and so the demigods had petitioned Lord Brahma to arrange for some solution to destroy Ravana. So as actually Lord Brahma behind the scenes um, petitioned the Lord to come and the Lord appeared in this particular way. Yada yada yadarmasya glanir bhavati bharata bhutana madarmasya tadat maham srijami aham parittanaya sadunam vinashanaya chaduskritam dharma samstapatartayam brahm sambhavambi yuge yuge. Well, the Lord came to give protection to the devotees and to annihilate this class of rakshasas. Rakshasas are very powerful living entities. They're much more powerful than human beings. And there's a planet not too far from the Earth planet. It's within the invisible atmosphere of the Earth where there is Rakshasas living. What the scientists say today, as far as the planets that we know of, is only the ones they can see. But around the Earth, uh, either above, or below the earth, there are many other planets, some by devas and some by uh, lower human beings, lower beasts, different types of lower persons. Uh, jinns, pishashyas, uh, various types of hideous living beings that live in the earth or come out of the earth or take birth on the earth when the sinful activities of the earth become more and more uh, it's interesting, the quality of the population will, increases according to the activities of the present population. So the more sinful people are on the earth, the more it attracts these lower entities to take birth on the earth. And the more pious people are, the more it attracts that type of living entity to appear on the earth. So you'll see in the families of many devotees today, many of the persons who were born in their families are actually persons who are devatas or coming from higher planets who have take birth to assist Lord Chaitanya in his movement of spreading Krishna consciousness around the world. But because the general population is still very sinful, you're, we're getting also um, demons appearing in different forms, just like every time there is some kind of natural disaster. It's explained in the Bhagavatam, and this is an indication that demons are being born right at that time. That's, that was illustrated by the appearance of Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. So we see there's a lot of, you know, cataclysmic events happening within the earth. Uh, and these are all influences by the appearances of demons throughout the you know throughout the area so they're not there's a beautiful book called shadow and substance it's written by a wonderful devotee who is no longer with us uh, suhotra maharaj 
he left the world about 15 years ago. But he was a great uh, author of many, many interesting books. And one is called Shadow of Substance. And he describes in that book the different planets that are circling the Earth, both higher and lower, and the beings on these different planets. It's an interesting story. Uh, and it's also cooperated in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, yeah, so uh, the Lord appeared at that particular time when there is a need to give protection to the saintly population. Okay, tomorrow I'll speak a little bit of some of the intrigue that centers around the life of Dasarath, his, his favorite queen, Kekaikei, and ultimately the banishing of Ram and Sita and Lakshman into the forest. So thank you for this opportunity to speak a little bit about Ram. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much uh, for very beautiful and uh, glorious pastimes. I think it's very difficult to read all the scriptures. So by your mercy through these daily classes, we are getting some nectar. So it's very, very useful. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for the opportunity. Ram Leela is so full of nectar. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. I still know like in India, they play Ram Leela, like especially in during this uh, time, every day in the night, like there is some show kind of a play. It's very yeah. popular still in rural areas. So when I was in, um, when I was in Tirupati for the opening of our Krishna temple in Tirupati, that was in the year 2007, um, part of the celebration it was a three day celebration going on. The devotees from all over ISKCON had come for this opening and we installed the uh, Radha Govinda deities along with the uh, Astasakis, just like Mayapur, practically it looks just like Mayapur. And it was a grand, grand, grand celebration. I remember that it was so, so overwhelmingly organized and so many wonderful events. But one event was one night they had a dance, a musical dance performance of the Ramayan with many of the characters within the Ramayan playing out a particular part of the Ramayan through dance and song. And it was just so beautiful. And these people, the way they were dancing and how they were expressing the Leelas was and all the devotees that were there were just absorbed. And it was one, it was a highlight of, one of the highlights of the whole festival. You see the Ram Leela done in song and dance and so beautiful. Yeah. So this is culture. This is tradition. This is spirituality. This is uh, transcendental happiness. Nowadays, our children, they're, they wander and they, they're looking for entertainment in the wrong areas on um, TV or movie screens or through some kind of media, which is just like a lot of garbage. But we have such a, a culture of entertainment through you know, these different leelas. That's true, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Yes, I agree. There's a lot really like in terms of glorifying lordships, lots of plays through plays, through kirtan, through chanting. A lot really. Yeah. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Uh, if you have any questions, any comments, any suggestions, please uh, unmute yourself. Or even any realizations, please unmute yourself or if you would like to type in chat window, I can read on your behalf. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.
Okay, wash your hands if you hit the floor. Make sure you can use you can use the spray bottle there. It's right there. It's a little guy there. Yeah. That's fine. You know, just long you. Did you bring the water? Okay. Okay. Anybody want to comment on Ram or tell, tell some personal experience of your of your your exposure to Ram Leela? Mm -hmm. Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Thank you so much for this sweet Ram Leela narration that is happening reading, leading up to Ram Navmi. Um, as you were speaking about uh, Vishwamitra Muni coming to uh, Dasharat, uh, that uh, beautiful uh, pastime is really very sweet. If I may just add a little something to that, is that okay? Please. Mm -hmm. So uh, Vishwamitri, Vishwamitra Muni comes uh, to Dasharat's court and he says, I want Ram and Lakshman to come and finish off these demons. They're causing so many problems. And of course, Dasharat is really shocked because he's thinking his two sons are so young. He's just a tender youth of 16 years. How can I send him into battle? It's uh, just too unnerving for him as a father to send his two sons into battle like that. And uh, Vishwamitra Muni is looking at him, you know, because he's a Brahmin and he's expecting Dashrath to respond. And Dashrath is so reluctant, so reluctant to send his sons. He's just so torn as a father. How can I send my sons? How can I send my son? And then Vashishta Muni then advises him. He says, do not anger this Brahmana. Give your sons. Do not worry. Everything will be all right. And so he reassures him. And so then Dashrat gets the courage to send Ram and uh, Lakshman. So that is a fatherly affection, you know, just like how Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda were constantly worrying about <laughs> little baby Krishna, though he's the Supreme Lord himself. Again, we see this fatherly concern for Ram and Lakshman. I just thought I'll bring that out. Uh, yeah, that's there. As long as wherever there's a, a father, there's affection. <laughs> but the interesting point is that it took the Vashishta Muni to push it, which kind of illustrates Brahminical Tejas, the power of Brahmins <coughs> and the influence of Brahmins and how the, how the dutiful Kshatriyas would always adhere to the advice of the Brahmins. Yes, Guru Maharaj, that is very true. We need the, we need the guidance of the spiritual master at all, at all twists and turns of life. Anyone else? I'm sure we have so many Ram Leela bhaktis, bhaktas out there who are too shy to say anything. What should we do? Should we close? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Vivek, what should we do? I can't see it. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
I think Satyan Prabhu is talking something. Yeah. Satyan Prabhu, Maharaj, please go ahead. Maharaj can't hear me. No, no, we can hear you, Prabhu. Oh. But I, I didn't get response from Maharaj, so that's why I'm saying. Yeah, I didn't hear you for a minute. Go ahead. Can you hear me, Maharaj, now? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, this is to your lotus feet on going to Srila Prabhupada. Um, just I would like to share my realization that uh, to study the to study or understand the scriptures, we have to become a human being first. And um, to become a human being, we have to take a shelter uh, of uh, Lord Ram, uh, and he is a perfect example um, how to live day to day life as a human being. That's my realization is. That's nice. It says that Mahabharata teaches you how to live. Ram, R Ramayan teaches you how to lead. And Srimad Bhagavatam teaches you how to love. So uh, we get a lot of understanding of how to live from the Mahabharata. But in Ramlila all too, because Ram is the righteous king. Mm. He teaches by example what it what it, the idea the ideal king, the ideal husband, the ideal son, the ideal friend. He's ideal in every role he plays. So we learn what are those qualities that make up these, this, this quality of perfection. Ram is righteous. If you want to look for a word to describe Ram, he is righteousness personified. Hmm. And that's illustrated throughout the Leelas. Mm -hmm. We'll get into a lot of the Leelas as time, as the days go on. Yeah. This was the introductory Leela, and then I'll speak about the um, intrigue with Kaikei and Mantara and uh, Dasarat. Then I'll speak about that tomorrow. And that has many, many, many interesting messages. <laughs> okay, anyone else? <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Sachin Arayan Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada, all glories to you, Maharaj. <coughs> Maharaj, uh, thank you for the narration and beginning uh, the Leelas. Uh, one thing I have always observed uh, is that generally across, uh, when people refer to Ramayan, you know, they, they say that, you know, he's an ideal householder, an ideal son, and the most common theme that people go away with, and, and even generally, if you, you know, is a victory of good over evil. And that's about it. And sometimes many authors and, you know, many pseudo secularist or pseudo religionists would then convert this into uh, some other theme that this personality didn't exist, but they represent something else. And I know we know that's not true because Prabhupada also comments uh, a lot on, on, on those sort of speculators but i would appreciate maharaj if you can say a little bit more about that uh, because i it's not just about victory of good over evil yes that is the theme but there is so many other lessons and so many other things and the fact that we are talking about the leelas the the, the interaction between the lord and the devotees and so much else is there but if you look at the general public outside you know we always hear about uh, it's just about good victory or good over evil and that's about it well, yeah, it's a good moral theme. People will pick up on it from that perspective. 
But in he's the, the Lord, this Ram is the supreme personality of Godhead. <laughs> so he's playing the part of a human being, but he's playing the part of a perfect human being and perfect in all those categories. So, and we'll see, you'll see there's some superhuman activities that Ram engages in. It's not some, some what they call a special effects in order to make, make the uh, uh, make the story more exciting. No, the Lord will use sometimes his godly powers in different situations, such as when he was battling uh, uh, Ravana, and there's many others also. How when he uh, he shot that arrow into the, the seven trees and went through the seven trees, came out the other side of the seven trees, went all the way around the earth and came back into his quiver. <clears throat> he wanted to, uh, he demonstrated that to Sugriva, that he had the power to help Sugriva in, you know, conquering over Bali. <clears throat> He fired that arrow to the seven trees and went through these seven trees and came out the other side. No, no, no mortal can do that. So there's much to the Ramayan. Yeah, if people say it's good over evil, that's nice. But the idea is not to take away from the position of the Supreme Lord and, and relegate him to as just a powerful human being. He is. He's the full in, he's a full manifestation of the Godhead. So yeah, there's a lot of speculation. They do that on they do that everywhere. On the scriptures, people like to take the scriptures and turn it into something mundane. Because Scriptures sound fantastic to the common people. They think these, these are only storylines that are put in there in order to make the story exciting. But they don't understand that the Lord is all powerful. And what goes on in a normal sense for us is just a small part of existence. Hmm. God is all powerful. <laughs> And when he comes, he exhibits his power in different ways. For Krishna, he married 16,108 queens. And for Ram, he, uh, he completely annihilated the, the whole dynasty of, uh, of Ravana. And he was exemplary and keeping his word in whatever he said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's just common because people don't want to worship God or don't want to acknowledge the presence of God or even if they do, they want to put God in their own categories. God fits in nobody's category. God is God. He has his own category. You have to learn about him from him and not from your own ideas of what is the Godhead or what is the Supreme Lord. It's fashionable for people to come up with their own interpretations of what is God or what he can do or what he can't do or what he does or what he doesn't do. It's just like, there's so much speculation but it's all useless. It's like it's like two ants on the ground. One ant is talking to the other ant, and they're saying, "You know, one ant's talking to the other ant, and he says, "You know, I think there's some greater power up there above us." And the other ant says, "No, no, no. You just had too much sugar. You don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing more." So our ant-like existence is what it is. 
we are so small and yet so proud of knowing so we we know so little and we're so proud of whatever little we know and it's usually most of the time it's only it's all wrong anyway how much we don't know is so it's so vast you can't even put it into books it's Whatever we know is so insignificant. So therefore, you have to, we have to hear from God himself through his pure representative if you want to know what, what is the Supreme Lord. Academic nations, scholars, scientists, philanthropists, people who have some credit in the secular world, they have no authority to comment on the nature of God and, and his activities. Thank you, Maharaj. It's like an atheist trying to describe what is God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because people have some kind of, you know, position in the material world based on some kind of intellect or some kind of ability, they think they can comment on God, but they can't. Therefore, Jiva Goswami says, before you can under, begin to understand, you have to understand there's an aspect of God you can't understand. It's called achintya. Achintya beta beta tattva. Achintya means inconceivable. If God was conceivable to us, then he, wouldn't be no, he would be no better than us. <laughs> he's inconceivable. And he's all powerful at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you can only learn that from the pure, pure devotees. Only they know it. They know something about God. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, there is one question on Facebook from Kelly Brindavan Mataji. Uh, she is asking how to be an exemplary devotee like Ram as a son, as a husband, and a king. Repeat your question. How to be an exemplary devotee like Ram as a son, as a husband, and as a king, etc. Well, you see the qualities he exhibits and you try to practice some of those qualities on your, on your own level. You can, and you can, God is good, but you can be a little good. God is all knowing, you can know something. God is the perfect son, but you can also be perfect in that category up to a certain extent. So what are those qualities that exemplify perfection? Learn the qualities and learn how to practice those qualities and become a devotee at the same time, because unless you practice devotional service, these qualities won't manifest themselves in the real sense of the term. Practice, that's all. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, can, um, devotees who are on the on the uh, Zoom call, when you ask your question, can you turn on your your cameras? It's actually much more proper to turn on your cameras and talk instead of just some unembodied voice coming through some machine. So we we request all the devotees, whoever asks a question, turn on your camera and talk. Much we having problem with our camera, so sorry. Oh, uh, no camera, huh? No. Yeah, no camera to sort that out. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Uh, 
Yeah, this is just um, uh, going back to what you said about Mahabharata, Ramayana, and uh, just I want to make sure because I was writing it down. Mahabharata teaches the principles, is that right? How to live. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Ramayana teaches how to live daily life by example. How to lead. Oh, right, how to lead, yeah, not lead, sorry. Live, love, live, lead, and love. <laughs> okay, live, lead, and love. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's wrong, okay. Vivek. That's really wrong. Mahabharata is how to live. Yeah, yeah, how to live. Mahabharata, how to live. Ma Mahabharata, you put Ramayana up there. No, no, yes, yes, Guru Maharaj, I typed wrongly. Sorry. All right. Mahabharata, how to live. Ramayana, how to lead. Srimad Bhagavatam, how to love. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but each one of them has, has some of the qualities of all the other three, all the other two. So it's all yeah. mixed in. Hmm. That's right, yeah. All, all, all these three require, that's my understanding. Not mm -hmm. so well. <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. And maybe Bhagavad Gita, how to leave this body. <laughs> you have to leave too. That's, that's another one. So Hare Krishna, dear devotees, any questions? Any last question? We are already like a few minutes over, but any last questions, suggestions or any realization? Do we have time for just one more sharing of our Vivek Prabhu? Yes, Mataji, please go ahead. I think. Turn on your camera. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. My humble obeisance is this uh, narration is just reminding me of so many beautiful pastimes that my grandmother would say. So I just wanted to share this one. Once I was just laughing about something. And she asked, what are you laughing about? I said, oh, never mind. It doesn't matter. And she was a little upset with me. And she said, you know, in Ram Leela, Lakshman, at the coronation ceremony, he was laughing. And everybody began thinking, why is he laughing like this? Hanuman thought, he's laughing at me because I'm a monkey. And I'm, you know, that's why he's laughing. Sita felt a little bit, you know, Maybe because I was in the home of another man, he's laughing at me. Ram was thinking, why is he laughing at me? Did I do something wrong in bringing Sita back? Is he laughing at me? So each person was having their own interpretations because he laughed. And then finally someone asked, why are you laughing, Lakshman? And Lakshman said, all those years of Vanvas, 14 years, my eyes never shut. All through the night, I stayed awake to guard Ram and Sita. But here I am, everything is over. The coronation ceremony is going to begin. And I'm yawning now. My eyes are closing now. <laughs> so I'm just laughing at myself that all those, all those times. And so when they came to know the real reason, everyone realized, oh, he's not laughing at me. So my grandmother pointed out, she's saying, when you laugh like this, and you don't tell me why. It's very upsetting. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very wise uh, statement by your grandmother. <laughs> right. And I grew up listening to, you know, these kind of things. You know, they would talk about Ram Vila and through, you know, daily life incidents would explain proper conduct, proper behavior. Not that I've learned anything. I'm just saying that they were so full of wisdom that they would talk like this to explain their point in a way that I remember even after so many years now. Just thought I will share that. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So Guru Maharaj, we don't seem to have any other question. Okay. So we'll end here and then we'll continue tomorrow with more Ramlila. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj, very much. Uh, it's really good to understand this Ramayana and 
lots of past tense in fact like i was not aware of it's just only common past tense we hear from uh, different sources so thank you very much and uh, thanks devotee for joining this session shila prabhu pad ki jai gurudev ki jai anant koti vishnu brind ki jai shila prabhu pad ki jai thank you guru maharaj hari krishna thank you very much for the hari krishna hari krishna Thank you, Thank you, Guru Dev. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Guru Maharaj, I have a question. Guru Maharaj. Yeah, Dipti. Sorry, I will put my video on. Sorry, one second. Yeah. Uh, you know the, is it the Suba? No, it's Dipti Guru Maharaj. Oh, Dipti. Okay, okay. Uh, Guru Maharaj, why is this background noise always going on in your thing? Is there some work going on about drilling and stuff? Oh, that's that, that's my computer. The fan is going on. Oh, okay. I kept on wondering how come you like you know every day there is a drilling going on. Is there a work going on? Must be well, so annoying. I'm sorry about that. This computer is quite old, so the fan comes on to clean the dust inside, so it comes on automatically. No, you don't apologize, Guru Maharaj. You must be you must be so much of annoying with like that noise all the time, isn't it? it must be hurting you. I don't hear it much. Maybe it comes through more on your side, um, but yeah. maybe I can I can try and rectify that somehow. Don't worry, that's fine. I I I was worried about you, Guru Maharaj. More. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, it gives me a chance to to, to uh, clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Hare Krishna. Yeah.